Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about abortive attempts at landscape architecture. And I'm hoping that I can talk to you a little bit about freedom. Um, I think it must have been three months ago, about. I was asked to give a, a speech this morning about freedom. And three months ago, I said, yeah, that'd be great. I'd be happy to do that. And I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I kind of freedom. I'm sure there's got to be something incredibly dramatic that we have to do about freedom, this freedom of speech, freedom to create. Um, but I thought, actually, I'm singularly unqualified to talk about freedom because I've actually really no idea what it is. Because I've actually been free all my life. I've been fortunate to have been born in a time when there was really no global conflict that would have dragged us all into army fatigues, and that we've enjoyed the longest period of unbroken prosperity, barring one or two scraps in parts of the world, not including this one, that actually when we talk about freedom and we talk about the, the challenges that people face around the world, actually it's a really hard thing to be able to, to kind of get your head around because we've actually taken it for granted. So I thought maybe what I would do is, is talk a little bit about my experiences and the forces, if you like, that have, have uh, shaped my view on, on, on freedom, the things that I've rebelled against, if you like, and the things that I've actually found to be inspiring, the things that have actually driven me, that have, a, have been possible, essentially, because of freedom. And I'd like to talk a little bit about, perhaps at the end of this, how design and the creative industries um, view freedom and, and what we can do with it and how we're empowered by it. I come from uh, Bonzi Design. As the people in the office say, it's my fault. Um, and Jaden is our digital arm, which we started a few months ago, so I'm a quick plug for them. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about the origins of that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about why I, I feel it's imp it, I have something to offer in terms of um, this whole idea of freedom. Because what we set out to do as a business, what every designer really sets out to do, is to become something of an architect of the brand experience. We need to be able to craft that whole experience that, that people enjoy with the products and services and, and tools that they use. And as we think about that, if we think about design, and this is something I've mercilessly ripped from uh, a very talented designer out of the state, we think about the business of design, we think about what we can actually achieve and how we can achieve a sense of freedom for the people who we seek to influence. We need to kind of go back and think about the origins of that and think about the context of where we're going to, where, where our work has come from, rooted, what's its sort of, um, its, its indigenous quality, if you will, and to think about how we affect people's lives. So I went back and thought, well, okay, if we're going to talk about how things affect people's lives, there are many, many wiser people than I will ever be, and probably wiser than most of us in this room all put together. And in the spirit of many of these speeches, we're going to enjoy seven uh, quotes that I've, I've pulled together to try and add a little dimension, a little historical uh, viewpoint on that. And there are seven of these quotes that will pop up in the next 20, 30 minutes. Um, and we're going to keep an eye out for them. And they will form the kind of pace breakers, if you like. These are the little commercial breaks along the way through this talk about, about freedom. I said I was very fortunate to have been brought up in a, in a part of the world in a, in a time of unparalleled um, peace and, to some extent, prosperity. I grew up in a time when there were no iPads. We, was no, um, it, was even, it, it predates ping pong or that game we used to play in pubs. Um, you had to make all of your own toys. You, you, you played with all your mates. Um, it was a time of, of simple pleasures, I dare say. And this is obviously rose-tinted historical glasses. But looking at that, um, you can imagine the kind of um, faintly bucolic background, if you like, and, and simple um, growth. So when we talk about freedom, that's what we meant by freedom. I was born into a, a fairly liberal British family. Um, we spent quite a lot of time listening to music. Music is going to be a theme that's going to run through the next 20 minutes. Um, this was a radio that we used to listen to the, radio, the music on. Um, it's one of those things you sort of twist the dial and it crackles and, and things of that kind. 
We also grew up, I say it was a period of peace. Um, we grew up at a time when the Berlin Wall, the Cold War was at, at its height. Um, the Berlin Wall divided um, the, 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 the country of Germany and was symbolic of the, the angst, if you like, and the, the tussle between the two great forces, which I should talk a little bit about. Because when we talk about freedom, it's, it's, it's really tempting to assume it's all about what you can't do. But so many of the things that we can do are made possible by forces which we do need to just touch on and we need to think about. I mentioned I came from a fairly liberal um, UK family. I had parents who traveled a great deal. And um, my father spent uh, four months living in the States um, and was in San Francisco in the summer of 1968, which he hasn't told me much about, but he promises me he didn't inhale. <laughs> my sort of understanding of freedom at the time was really based much more on what I could read in comics. And I was a great avid consumer of, of uh, all things uh, DC and Marvel. I was a great consumer of music. Um, this was the first album I ever uh, bought. Um, and the Beatles were great, but they weren't anything like as good as the Rolling Stones. At that time, there was just this proliferation of all sorts of wonderful musical things that we could enjoy. The, the, the labels, the, the extraordinary um, profusion of music opportunities that came out through the 60s and 70s was really, really uh, overwhelming. We didn't realize it at the time. This was just what you went queued up and spent your pocket money on. But music was really, really, really a passionate um, I was passionate about it. It was a very much a driver of, of, of all of the, the context, if you like, of which I treated both my education and the, the concepts and the thoughts that I've been having since then. Music and art. Art as in the, the kind of op art of, of the period um, was just at the age of 12, 13, I thought this was so cool. This couldn't get any cooler. This was just absolutely what I wanted to do. I wanted to be in a rock and roll band. I wanted to learn how to do art. But Actually, this is where I went to school. <laughs> so this is all going on in my head. I've got DC Comics, I've got Dad in San Francisco, I've got rock and roll music, and somewhere up there, I think I'm third from the left, there's a little picture, there I am. Um, I went to this lovely little choir school, and there's Winchester Cathedral in the background, and it was a very cloistered and very calm and very uh, orderly society. But what I really wanted to do was to get involved in this. So off I went to school. Um, and try to reconcile rock and roll with Latin. And here's the first of my little quotes. I thought we'd start with the, the sort of the godfather of freedom, if you will, Mahatma Gandhi. And he says, freedom is not worth having if it doesn't include the freedom to make mistakes. And I made a ton of them, absolute ton of them. One of which was, after I left school, was assuming that I could actually, I was very interested in design. I, I, studied design from the age of 13. I did an O-level in design, an A-level in design. Um, and I thought it'd be really wonderful to, to actually have the opportunity to create new landscapes. So I thought that would be great. So I went off to Landscape Architectural College, and I was fresh out of school. I was 18, and I had been to this cloistered little boarding school, and I was going to do landscapes. But the problem about landscapes in the UK is that actually they don't really look like that. They look much more like this. And you have to struggle with the Latin names of plants and so on. It was a bit of a disaster. So my first attempts at that weren't very good. However, when you're at art school and you're not at school anymore, you can actually do all sorts of shit that you couldn't do at school and discover wonderful bands like The Clash. Go to great places like Blitz. This is some shots from the 19, early, early, uh, no, late 70s. And get involved with dress up in stick pins in yourself and tattoo tat, uh, those tartan trousers that were very popular at the time, sort of Vivian Westwood, if you like. And coming from that, that cloistered background to actually then be exposed to this amount of, of, of pure anarchy was fabulous. It was so invigorating. Anyway, I got involved with um, organizing um, Adam Ant and, the, and his music for, for a short while. The landscape architecture was a disaster. Uh, did that for two years, couldn't get any further with that. Was much more interested in, in, uh, in, in rock and roll. But I wasn't going to be any good at that either necessarily because the problem about, and here's the second point. You see, freedom has a way of destroying things. So having spent far too much time listening to music and drinking beer, I realized actually I had to go back to work. And I really 
knew I wanted to be in design, but I didn't have any money left because I'd spent it all chasing the clash around the country. And so I had to go back and work. Uh, I worked in kitchens. I wanted to be in catering. I wanted to be in restaurants. That was no fun. I worked in a plastics factory, learning how to feed beads of plastic in, close the gate, press the button, piece of plastic comes out, put it on the conveyor belt. I thought, that's really no fun. I learned this as a builder, and I even emptied dustbins. So I did this for a year, and at the end of all of this, I thought it was a bit like going off into the wilderness and sort of coming back and going, 40 days and 40 nights, if you remember that story. I thought, OK, enough of this. I actually really do have to get serious about this. And all this freedom that I enjoyed, all this freedom has actually now become a real bugbear. It's a real pain. So I took myself off to Brighton, which has one of the finest illustration colleges in, in, the, in the UK, Sussex University. And Brighton was just fantastic. Brighton was, it's, it's, it's Britain's answer to San Francisco. It's just this wonderful little Victorian seaside town. Um, all sorts of exciting things going on there. It's a place where the mods did all their thing. We had scooters. We had Vespers. We had people in Parker jackets. We had the bands like the Specials that used to come and play at the art school. It was just the best time. Absolutely brilliant. Um, and I got heavily involved into graphic design. Um, and moved into the, uh, what I call the instant gratification of print. So here's the third aspect of, of this. Um, it's true, the truth will set you free, but only after it's pissed you off first. It's really hard. People say, you know, that great line from, uh, who is it now? The actor who said, you know, you can't handle the truth. Um, it's very, very true. So truth will set you free, but first it has to piss you off. So left um, art school, went to London, um, worked for a number of years in London, liked that a lot, thought, well, I like Brighton, so I'll go to San Francisco, did that for a bit, and then came to Singapore. So from liberal upbringing, from trying all sorts of stuff, and finally settling down into the business of branding and design, uh, focused very much on, on building a business here, which is a real kind of polyglot of cultures and of opportunities. And for the last 20 years, Bonzi Design has been growing on the back of Singapore's success. Um, we found the constraints that everybody feels about Singapore, all those points that everyone says it's so uh, restricted, or it's dull, or it's narrow, or it's too small. For us, we thought these were simply opportunities. And so we've been very much part of the, the creative um, uh, culture of Singapore in terms of the way people work. We've, We've had people who've joined our company when we started who've left Bonzi Design to join other companies to start their own company, to have people leave them to start their own company. We're this kind of great grandfather of design um, in, in, in this country here, um, along with many others, of course, but that's kind of where we've been. And we've been part of that, 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 that uh, activity. But as we know, in the last few years, the freedoms that we can now enjoy through the proliferation of the internet, through um, a, a more uh, relaxed societal constraints that have been able to enjoy. We now have the whole kind of issue of freedom of speech. And I think it's fair to say Singapore is learning how to speak freely. Their initial response has been to sort of backbite and snap and, and tell stories and get a bit tangled up in the, in the, the naysaying because it's the first time and they've actually been able to do so. And that's a great thing. But there is really this, this whole sort of idea that, that we can just change everything and we're going to change everything around because obviously what went before is constraining, is restricting, and therefore it's impinging and, and preventing our creative expression. I don't believe that's the case, but I, picked, I shot this day before yesterday. Um, it's actually, a, I, thought, I thought it was a kind of political statement. I realize now it's actually a trailer for a new Kevin Spacey movie. But I thought that this is something that you would not have seen on a Singapore bus shelter in Clark Quay even five years ago. So that was interesting. And we're seeing this kind of um, angst, if you like. And, and one of the things about freedom, rather like night, you really can't have night without having day. You can't have freedom without having control to play against it. It's the other side of the coin. If everything is free, then actually, are we really free? Or are we simply in a bit of a mess, and we don't know how to control things, and we don't know what we're doing, because 
There's nothing to bounce off against. There's no contrast. There's no complement. So against the societal backdrop of, of uh, I'm not going to go into the, the tiger mom, but let's just say the, the cultural constraints and the cultural um, viewpoint of, of, of society and the, the old way of thinking about things, we have that contrasted with this sort of thing. And the, these, are, these are, are growing pains. These are things that the country and the culture is growing up with. Fourth, bon mot. I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. I think that's kind of an interesting thought. OK. So when we talk about freedom, we have to think about, as night follows day and as, as, as black is, is made possible by white, we have to think about what, we're, what constitutes a lack of freedom in order to celebrate the freedom we have, in order to take it seriously and to defend it to the death. And we think about the freedoms that have been denied so many people across the world. We think about the, cult, the, the, the uh, regimes that have actually constrained and prevented freedom in the way that we have taken it for granted for so long, myself uh, clearly in that case. And we think about the way that design and art have had a role in the expression or the denial of freedom to those people who they seek to subjugate. And we think about how those, the power of design, the power of communication is, in this instance, really about control and about fear, about forcing people to do things, threatening, coercing, cajoling, and to a certain extent, um, in many cases, um, capital. So there's a kind of visual language that we've understood to be the antithesis of freedom. And that would have run across 50% of the planet were it not for the efforts of this man. Hands up, anybody who knows this is? Mikhail Gorbachev. So there he is with, the, with the, the telltale sort of Harry Potter thing that he has on his forehead there. Man of the year. Um, here he is with his best mate. These two people single-handedly or double-handedly are responsible for the fact that we can enjoy the things that we do today. Were it not for the end of the Cold War, we would not be enjoying the internet, we would not be able to travel to all the places we, we go to, and we would not be in a position to enjoy the freedoms that so much of the Western world has taken for granted. The deal that was struck over a, a sort of single malt and a, and a roaring log fire um, has had an enormous impact, particularly on Europe, but by inference, the rest of the world as a center of cultural influence. So the demolition of that wall that I showed you right at the beginning, the destruction of the Berlin Wall, the opportunity that it has to allow people to reach out to people that were either family or at least culturally across uh, a great divide um, has been a, a sort of seminal moment, if you like, in the celebration of freedom. It's allowed us to parody the lunacies of the stasis um, conditions of Eastern um, and uh, Soviet thought, and to be able to sort of almost debunk and to, to, to um, uh, make ridicule of the things that used to be frightening. Now, we have Tiananmen Square in this part of the world. There's, there are plenty of things that are happening in the Middle East. There are things happening all over the world, which are parallels to also could, but we've got 10 minutes to finish this, so we're not going to go into those. But what I wanted to do was to just take through a thread now from that macro kind of um, political situation and thread it through to what it's done for the business of design and art. And when we think about this sort of this, this style of, of muscular typography, constructivist um, typography, and after that has been debunked and made freely available to us to parody and to celebrate its demise, for that it is, um, we can see how the ironic parodying in the design and the, in the graphic world. This has allowed a whole new language, a language of freedom based on a cultural backdrop of lack of freedom. So by twisting it and by perverting it, if you will, um, we're able to create something quite interesting. And we're all very familiar with this. And so it builds out and so it goes on. He's even David Cameron saying yes to take action. 
even to the point of taking political satire and, and all of the graphics of state control and turn it into a fashion brand and turn it into a, 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 an example of, of how to use propagandist graphics as an expression of freedom that would have been denied to all those people who originally created it. We're seeing the same thing with, with um, um, the, the Shanghai Tang business, for example, in, in Hong Kong, celebrating Mao, etc. That same political propagandist graphic has been used in countless places all over the world because it's a very powerful symbolic um, system that, that has its reference in those stasis posters of the, of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and is now being used for the force of good. And it's being parroted to the point almost of, of absurdity, where it's now become part of the language of, um, of, uh, of, of I don't know, irony. Brings me to the fifth point. People demand freedom of speech as a compensation for the freedom of thought, which they seldom use. I thought it was rather delighted. It reminds me of the thing that, you know, common sense is, is probably one of the most uncommon senses that we, uh, encourage, we, we engage with. And when we think about common sense, there are still pockets in the world which can actually um, be seen to, to have not kept up with the plot. Very, very impressive, wonderfully coordinated, um, tremendous examples of, sort of ant behavior. Um, and we're all familiar with this to the point of parody. But it's ironic that in the UK, there's a hairdresser in North London who took a photograph or, or took a picture of this, uh, of Kim, Kim Jong-un and, uh, and used it as a promotion for his, his, uh, his hairdressing business. In, in the, now, in the UK, you can do this. You could take photographs of the Queen, witness the anarchy in the UK, and you can do whatever you like because we have absolute freedom, absolute freedom. The problem with this was that the North Korean embassy was 10 minutes up the road in a small house in Golders Green somewhere. And uh, so they came past with their little sort of gray suits on. And uh, he was still had a cease and desist order from Kim Jong-un himself. So the ability to, to, to debunk state control and to celebrate freedom is something that we totally take for granted and should be protected at all costs. Most people don't really want freedom because freedom involves responsibility, and most people are frightened of responsibility. I think it's probably true. We see the celebration of freedom. Surely this must rank as one of the most sort of um, quintessential uh, uh, freedom uh, expressions, if you like. But through Andrew Lloyd Webber and, and, the, and the mastery of film, you've now got a $200 million um, film about Les Miserables starring Jackman and... and uh, Russell Crowe and everybody else, which I'm sure the original guys who were dying on the barricades in, in 17th century France would have found a little bit hard to understand. We celebrate freedom all the time. We, we enjoy it because it happens to somebody else, the miserable stuff, so that we can have the good stuff. So from Mahatma Gandhi to Morgan Freeman, That sense of dancing to freedom, that wonderful liberation of South Africa. I mean, I was, I was watching the other day that great rugby film about um, thing. It's just a phenomenal, phenomenal film. Um, and a phenomenal time. And, and South Africa is, is, is going through its growing pains, but it's getting there. It's dancing its way to freedom. And in terms of the way that that, that, that language, that, that, that visual um, feel of, of, of freedom, what it means in the graphic world, has given us people like Banksy. Um, has given us Damon Hirst and his strange fixation with chopping up large animals and putting them, pickling them in formalin and then putting them in, in, in water for people to see and walk through. And the 50 million pound skull. You kind of go, this would not be possible were it not for all of the efforts of everybody else on the barricades for the last 150 years to allow this sort of um, thing to take place. Which brings me to the seventh point, and the final part of this, this um, little piece this morning. Um, man is condemned to be free because once thrown into the world, he's responsible for everything he does. It's up to him to give his life a meaning. So as a creative 
group as creative people. We're all painters and photographers and designers and illustrators and, and great coffee, by the way. I'm shaking like a leaf. Um, there is one thing that is really frightening. I think we, and when we get there, you all kind of get, oh, of course it is. It's not necessarily Nicholson. It's not necessarily Slender Man, although I have to say, that is scary shit. It is seriously frightening stuff. I mean, it's just put the headphones on, turn the lights out, and put it on your laptop. Unbelievably terrifying. It's not even the prospect of getting fat. Um, the really scary thing is this. What are we going to do with the blank canvas? That's the most terrifying thing. People talk about freedom. They say, well, we're going to be free. We can do anything we want. We can just be great. We can do everything we want. And then you sit there and you go, fuck, what do I do now? Uh, where do I start? Uh, if I mark it, then it's, it's broken. It, you know. But we're broken into two camps. I was thinking about this um, yesterday, which is one of the reasons these slides are a little late getting here today. Um, because I was just playing with an idea, which I'm glad that I took the time to do so. Because actually, there are two different thought, trains of thought here. As artists, we know what we must do. We've got to get in there and just, because you can't help yourself. It's, it's just a compulsion. You have to paint or draw or make music or do whatever it is that you do. There's no question of, yeah, but I'm not sure if I'm going to get enough money for it. Who do I send the invoice to? This is stuff you have to do. You have to paint. As designers, we crave order. Crave order. We talk about freedom, but actually, oh, freedom's scary. This is a blank sheet of paper. What if I get it wrong? What if I can't rub it out? What if I, we crave order. It's just part of the DNA. It's part of what makes the difference. This is what we do. We organize principles, and we think about logos, and we sort of put things together nicely. So that's how we would respond to an empty canvas. We like analysis and development and ideas and structure. We like, at the end of the day, a really tight brief. A really tight brief, because only with a really tight brief, the antithesis, I suggest, of freedom, can we actually create something that is, it, it forces connections, it forces creative thought, it forces solutions. It forces structure, because against structure, we can allow things to vary from the structure. It forces a sense of logic. Freedom and logic don't always go hand in hand together. Purpose, absolutely. And we're always striving towards solutions. And those solutions, I suggest, and with a design hat on, not an art hat on, are made possible by freedom. So if we have too much freedom, we wander around and decorate. But if we have a tight brief, we actually can create solutions. So I suggest freedom is all very well, but what we really want is free DOM. <laughs> so thank you very much indeed, ladies and gentlemen. Um, this, by the way, for the girls, is Jude Law. How about that? Yep. That's supposed to be, this is the date, and what, what I want to know your opinion between when you're more creative, when you have a white canvas and you can do whatever you want, or when you have a tight brief, which you have many, many constraints, and out of those constraints, you have to come up with something really good. So, when, in your perspective, when you are more creative, when you have the freedom of doing whatever you want and say no mistakes, or you have a For me, personally, the latter, the type brief, because I'm a designer. I'm not an artist. I can do watercolors. My drawing's not too bad. I'm quite good with charcoal. I know how to handle paints, but I am not an artist. I am not driven to paint, to create, to, to, to make that mark. I don't have to do that. What I get my sense of creative satisfaction is working to create a solution from a seemingly intractable problem. Series of 
of issues that have to be addressed and dealt with so that you create something that is better than what it was before. I, I can't work in the absolute, in the, in the infinite, to just sit there and close my eyes and paint or to write poetry. I, I just don't have it in me. But I can solve a problem and, and use for, for what we commonly call creative skills, which shorthand for either singing, dancing, um, writing music, or coloring in, those creative skills are our tools to create solutions. So for me, that's, that is, is what makes that possible. Um, give me a blank canvas, and I will cover it in ink. But is it art? No, I'm decorating. But creativity is not decoration. Creativity is problem solution, in, in my view. Other people have a different definition. That's great. They can come next month. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, that's the way I look at it. Um, if I was to tell you that we work for P&G, would that answer your question? <laughs> um, the, uh, this is, I'm, I'm, I will regret saying this, but I will say it anyway. Um, there is no brief too tight. <laughs> I certainly would regret wearing them, I think. Um, no, because I think that it's a challenge. It's, if there are constraints and restrictions and so on, but there's an objective, you've got to somehow we have a saying in England, turn, a, silk, sorry, turn a, a, a sow's ear into a silk purse. In other words, a pig's ear into a silk purse. You've got to somehow make, uh, find a way through a, a conundrum, a difficult problem with barricades and borders. You've got to find your way through it. That in and of itself is the creative path. The solution that makes people go, oh, OK, that's great, is, a very, is where the creative juice comes from. I couldn't believe that you could turn improve this by an extra 10% or make it that much more visible, legible, readable, understandable. Because it just depends how you look at it. And I think the creative, the creative activity is about point of view and about angle of approach, if you like. So if you just stare at it and go, that's too hard, you simply aren't looking at it the right way around. Turn the paper around and go, well, what if we go this way? Why does it have to be like that? Why don't we try it like this? If they've always done it like this, then we need to find another way. Um, so I think that's, that's, the kind of, that's the creative part, really, is figuring out how to have the solution. What the graphics looks like, is it pink, green, blue, spot? It doesn't, I mean, that, that's incidental, essentially. It's what that will happen. It'll happen well, hopefully. But it, it's this problem solution that's important. So we've turned away briefs because we don't agree with the client's position on certain things. Maybe it's more ethical. We're more likely to turn something down for ethical reasons or, frankly, for economic reasons because they've got a terrible reputation for not paying their bills. Um, when I run a company of 30 people, that's a primary concern. Um, so those are more likely, ethics and economics, more likely to be than saying, I'm sorry, this brief's too hard. The harder the brief, the more we want to get into it, actually. Excellent question. Yep. Hi. How does, how does the, let me make sure that I've understood your question correctly, I'll just repeat it. You're asking how does the, uh, the kind of extraneous political situation affect our, the work that we do and, and our ability to do creative work. Um, I guess I'm, I'll look at two things. One is we've actually, we have no political agenda viewpoint whatsoever. 
And having worked for 20 years in Singapore, that's been a very, very smart position to take. <laughs> it would have been foolish to think anything else. Um, we are vested in this country, but I don't carry a red passport. I'm an observer, uh, an affectionate observer, and, and a big fan. But that doesn't give me the right to start making any noise about these things. The country is busy learning how to do that itself. We're observers of that too. I have one or two views about be careful what you wish for. But I think that, that backdrop is going to happen. It, it is, in, and forgive me if this sounds a little bit, well, don't take it the wrong way. Singapore is, is, is in its late teens politically in terms of just figuring out you know, how to take the car keys and stay up late and do those late teen things because it now can. So it's experiencing its own sense of freedom. So, but I think in terms of how we approach our design work, um, I think it's, it's, it's uh, not subliminal, but it's, it's a subtle viewpoint. There's more discussion. There's a lot more opportunity. There's, we've got more access, perhaps, than we did before. It's not driven by politics, but simply driven by the internet. Um, and we kind of enjoy that, and it's a little bit more free in that sense. Um, I, I, I first came to Singapore, very, 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 very first time I came to Singapore. Um, they were still cutting people's hair at the airport because your hair went down over the collar of your shirt. There was a guy with a little Malay barber at the side who used to cut people's hair when they came into Singapore if they came off a plane from pretty much anywhere else. So it's come a long way. Um, and I think that, that sort of uh, change is, has, it does influence the design work but in a really subtle way. I, I think it's more just, it, it, it influences the way we, our studio works. Probably more that's the point um, than I think it necessary is we don't have any, you know, we don't produce more political work in that sense, or work that's that much more expressive or you know, avant-garde, or no, not really. Remember, we're designers, not the artist side. Um, I think I've answered half of your question, and, and, but maybe you've got an idea of where we are on that, and I think it's, we celebrate that freedom, we cherish it, we are glad to, to see more of it, but we don't have a view that we somehow need to be instrumental in agitating for still more, because that's not our role, certainly not mine. Somebody else? Yes, you want to? Is anyone taking notes? <laughs> that, was a big, that was a big three questions. Um, let, me, let me take the, the, the last one first. I think it's, it's a very interesting point you brought up, which is that it's, and to me that goes into the economics, because the economic structures of companies, the bigger the organization, the harder it is to do things differently, because organizations are, their very success and their continuation and then let's get into the stock market, but let's say their continuation is predicated on their being built to, to, to continue in the path that they've chosen. So all of the Six Sigma and all of those doctrines, which have been hugely successful at, at actually building and enabling small companies to become big companies, are almost by definition kind of counter-cultural to the idea of creativity. They're antithetical to it. So they, pre they prevent in many ways because they clearly, you're, you're bucking the system. And in order to do something creative, you have to shake the system and, and make it re-look at the things that it took for granted, the things that it's always done. And you go, 
why we're always doing it like this. And that is, that is the job of the creative industry, I suggest, to, to, to force clients to re-look at what it is that they always do and say, we could find, should find together, because it's not an imposition, together we need to find a better way. And we're seeing it a lot, obviously, in, in, in you know, the Silicon Valley, a place in Berlin, um, where there's some tremendous creative work going on. London, too, and parts of Asia. Um, but I think the big organizations, at the end of the day, are merely hives of lots and lots of individuals. Um, and much the same reason that people say, well, B2B advertising is different from B2C advertising. Uh, business to consumer to business to business. You can't use it. At the end of the day, the consumer and the business are actually the same thing. It's simply a business is made up of 14,000 consumers. And so it's a human to human condition. It's a human to human um, uh, communication path that we need to build in order to have a dialogue about how to make that company's business be more successful through having more innovative products. You don't have to have a Steve Jobs and a Johnny Ives to be a successful or innovative business. It's happening all over the place, in some of the most unusual places, because people have the, dare I say, balls to actually go and address these things head on, on a human to human. It's not about sending emails and writing contracts and all this stuff. That just ensures you get paid. But the success of a creative enterprise is down to the ability to have a, an intelligent peer-to-peer -peer dialogue about how the creative services will improve that organization's business. Remember this, clients never hire designers and creatives because they want to have more creative product. They want to have bigger business. And they want a pay rise, and they want their boss to promote them. Those are the reasons that, that we get hired as a creative industry. Because it's complete, and we have a different subject here, but it's, it's illustrative, I think, to your point, which is that actually organizations don't hire creative people to do nice things. They want to influence their market. They want to increase market share. They may not use that language, but that's actually what they want to do. And from a personal point of view, i.e. their persons, they want to be successful in their careers. And that's critically important. So, in order to make that work in big organizations, which are following all the Six Sigma and everything else, and particularly, I think, in very traditional um, local businesses, which have the tried and trusted, and there's a very hierarchical, um, Confucian-based sort of corporate structures based on the family, where there is no, which I put that thing about Facebook, you know, that is breaking down, that is being questioned, and the, you know, a younger group are having conversations with older groups at a peer-to-peer -peer level that would never have happened 15 years ago. And in fact, interestingly, some of the, 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 the hottest IT jobs at the moment, some of the hottest, excuse me, not IT, mentoring jobs, the idea somehow that mentoring is something that happens between the grand old vizier and somebody with as much gray hair as me to the younger people, and somehow we're going to impart this wisdom and, and, and bring them on and so on. Yeah, hopefully we do. But actually, the newest form of mentoring is 18-year-olds telling the 48-year-olds how to use their Twitter feed. And there is a reverse mentoring happening from the tech departments and the young people who are coming in and mentoring board members and some government-linked organizations in this country about actually how to deal with social media, how to handle the, the business of IT. You can't just say, well, my secretary does my letters. That doesn't work. So that's some of the, the breakdown, if you like, of the barriers of, of, of cultural barriers, if you like, that are within or are endemic in the difference between a creative services industry and the, the client groups. Wobbly answer, but some points in there. Thank you for your question. We will now wrap up. Uh, let's give a round of applause for John. You're welcome.